so uh, those were the basic ways. Uh, those were the basic ways of processing uh, of processing queries. So how can you make it faster? Um, what are, what are some heuristics? So um, the the simplest one is uh, query caching. So you're a web search engine, and um, as you're processing queries, you will notice that uh, some queries you're seeing them over and over and over again. In fact, if you if you tried to plot the frequencies of queries, uh, you would get zip's law. Right? So zip's law holds for queries as well as for individual words within queries. Um, but it holds for the whole queries as well. So what you could do, and what search engines do do, is um, they take common queries and they pre-cache the result sets for those queries. Right? So that means that when you see that query again, and you're going to see it over and over and over again because it's a frequent query, uh, you don't actually have to compute anything. You don't have to hit your index. You just fetch the result set and uh, spit it out to the user. And typically, you don't need to, you don't need to compute the entire result set you just store the first page, the top 10, and you spit it out at the user as fast as you can. Because odds are they're not going to go to the second page. And if they go to the second page, all right, fine. Then you actually recompute the result set and, and, and give it to them. Um, so uh, by the way, that's part of the reasons why many search engines give an estimate of how many results there are in the query. Because they don't actually know. They haven't run your query. They're just giving you a set of results that they've pre-computed at some point in the past, and they have no idea what the number of matches is now. Um, just because they're lazy, right? So, um, uh, so this is nice. It's space efficient. Half the users are never going to go uh, beyond the second page. Uh, and um, if you if you do this efficiently, you can actually reuse partial queries in uh, when you see new ones, right? Uh, so that's the good things about caching. The bad things is it's Zipf's law. So Zipf's law is good and bad at the same time. The head of Zipf's law is good for caching. The tail is bad because you know that half of your queries are actually going to be unique and you're never ever going to see them again. All right. So, um, so trying to cache them is uh, is a is is a waste. Uh, another problem with that is this cache. It is going to take a certain amount of resources, and that cache is going to compete with your normal index cache, right? Because uh, they also use caching for indices, right? And, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and, and there's actually some studies that show that if you took that cache that you used for caching the query results and just did a better job of caching the indices, uh, you can actually get better performance than that. It's a little bit surprising, but uh, turns out to be true. Um, and of course, anytime you have an index update, so anytime you recrawl, that invalidates uh, the cache that you've computed. You can incrementally update the index, but you cannot incrementally update the result cache because the formula are just a bit too complicated. In the index, you just store term frequencies and document frequencies. So those are trivial to update incrementally. Uh, BM25 scores are not trivial to update. Um, OK, uh, so another thing that uh, comes up uh, often. So if your queries are conjunctive queries, so that means either proximity queries, where you're looking for terms within a certain distance of each other, or you have a Boolean end, then uh, sometimes you'll have a situation like that. So uh, you have um, you're merging two lists, and uh, one list is quite long, and the other list is quite short. Right? So, and, and you're assuming that the lengths are really, really different from each other, so maybe like you know, 10 and 1,000. Um, so what happens in this case? Linear merge, it's linear in the total size of the two lists. So uh, it's going to take m plus n operations. And that is a bit wasteful, because uh, if you have a query like that, right, so you have artwork which occurs in one document, and big, which occurs in a bunch of documents, so a linear merge is just basically going to happily... Uh, so uh, it's just going to start incrementing the pointer and keep going and going and going and going and going. And really what you need to do is you, you just need to try to get to that 51 as quickly as possible for the Boolean query, uh, for, the, for the AND query, or for the PROX query. So if that is the case, you can do it faster, right? And the faster way to do it is to use uh, binary search. So you don't, have to linear, you don't have to linear merge the two lists because you know that the result must be an intersection. It's not the union, right? So if you had the or, or if you had the cosine, the result is the union. But if you have a Boolean end or a proximity, the result is the intersection. This means that 
no documents will match unless they contain this 51. So you can ignore the rest of this big list. And the way to do it quickly is to take the 51 and then use binary search over the long list to see if it contains 51 or not. And if it contains 51, yep, your output. Uh, if it doesn't contain, then you say there is no results. Right. So uh, overall, the way this works is you iterate over the short list and do repeated binary searches over the long list. And if you're clever, then you can actually constrain the binary searches from the previous, from the previous iteration, because you know that the next iteration it doesn't have to look at the entire list. Right? It actually has to stop at where the previous one has found a match, because both lists are sorted. That's where you're getting that. Okay. So uh, now that will have a complexity of m log n, uh, which in some cases will be a lot better than m plus n. Basically, so you just check if m is smaller than n over log n. And if it is, then it's worth using it. Uh, otherwise, it's not. Uh, do take care uh, of looking at the constants, though, because linear merge and binary search have slightly different uh, constant factors. <clears throat> so, uh, so that's a nice heuristic. Uh, things to keep in mind, it only works for conjunctive queries. So it wouldn't work with a cosine or with TFIDF. Um, and it does break if the lists are compressed. Right, so if you have if you have compressed your lists, right, if you use the delta encoding and uh, and v-byte encoding, then you cannot do this. And why can't you do this? Because you can't, right? Because you won't have uh, you, you won't actually have fifty one here. You'll have fifty one minus thirty seven and thirty seven minus twenty one. You'll have the deltas in the list. So as you hop around in the list, it won't make sense. It's not. It, it, it's still sorted but you would have to decompress it before sorting. Right. So, uh, so that's a bummer because compression is a good thing, right? And we have a very fast way to compress and decompress lists, so it'd be nice to be able to use it. And it turns out that you can, right? So um, you can if you use something called skip pointers. So skip pointers are basically an extra data structure that you introduce on top of a compressed list, right? So um, uh, that allows you to not decompress the whole thing, right? So if this was the original inverted list, right, these are the positions of documents in it, uh, and this is the compressed one, right, and these are just the delt deltas, so 5 is 1,007 minus 1,002, and 1 is 1,008 minus 1,007. So what you do is you pick certain positions uh, in the list, and uh, you treat them as checkpoints. So what this means is somewhere in the beginning of the list, you store a certain number of these checkpoints, and you say that maybe uh, maybe 1007 was a checkpoint, right? So then you take 1007, store it in the prefix, and include a pointer to where it is in the compressed portion of the list. So how does this help you? This helps you because if you say you're searching for a thousand for 1008, and you want to find it in the compressed list. What you do is you quickly scan over the prefix, which is relatively small, and uh, you, you use binary search in the prefix, unless you, unless you want to compress the prefix as well, which you could. Uh, right. So you binary search over the prefix, you find the closest, uh, you, uh, you find the left boundary of what you're searching for. So if you're searching for 1008, you find 1007, right? You jump into the compressed list, now you know that this entry actually corresponds to 1007. So what you can start doing is you can start decompressing from this point and linearly looking at, uh, linearly looking for your match. Right? So you know that this is 1007, you add one, you get 1008, yay, we found what we were looking for. Great. So uh, skip pointers basically allow you to jump into the right portion of the list and just decompress a little bit uh, from that. Point. <clears throat> so again, it's only relevant for conjunctive or proximity queries. So it, you know, it, don't don't try to use it for a cosine. Uh, and uh, the overall. Uh, so here's the here's the overall cost uh, that you would have, right? So um, you are storing uh, you are storing checkpoints every c entries in the list. So c is the distance between checkpoints. Uh, that means that for a list of little n posts, you would have n over c checkpoints. So what is the cost of finding a match? The cost of finding a match is you have to search 
you have to binary search over the prefix. There are n over c entries, so that's just a log of that. Right? So that's how long it takes me to find the closest checkpoint. Uh, and then I jump to checkpoints, and I have to decompress the list. And on average, um, I'm going to have to decompress half of C, right? because I don't know where I'm going to land. Right? So uh, that's going to be the overall cost of you finding one match. And of course, you're going to do it multiple times, because the short list could have more than one entry. So it's m times that entire uh, quantity. That, that is your cost of computing your match. Okay. So uh, that's that's how you use skip pointers, and uh, and, uh, and and that's how much it would uh, cost you. <clears throat> okay. So uh, what are other ways to speed up the execution? So um, you you can really milk the fact that the user is not going to look at the entire list of results, right? So if you assume that the user is only interested in at most k results, then you can try. Uh, to take advantage of that, right? You don't have to compute the entire result set. This is particularly good if you have Boolean queries or proximity queries, because there, the result either matches or doesn't match. So as soon as I have k matches, I can stop, right? I don't have to process uh, the entire result set. I can just stop and spit it out. Um, so, um, so for Docker time, basically what you do is you start processing your query uh, and as soon as you get k matches that satisfy, that are either a match to the query or, uh, or you can estimate an acceptance threshold, right? So as soon as, you get, uh, as soon as you get k matches that are above that threshold, you stop and uh, you don't process the query any further. You just give the results to the user. So that's called uh, early stopping or early termination. <clears throat> so uh, what are other ways in which you could speed things up? So, um, one, uh, this, uh, here you're going into approximations, uh, really. So um, top docs is an effective strategy. It works both for document at a time and term at a time indexing. Uh, the basic idea there is if you are ranking documents by something like a TFIDF score, then some terms in some documents have a lot of impact. And other terms in those documents don't have much. So what you can do is you can trim the inverted list for each uh, term, right? So um, you pick a k, uh, and then you don't store more than k elements in each uh, list. So that allows you to put a cap on how long the lists are going to be. You can have shorter lists, but you can't have uh, longer lists, right? So uh, and then you do your normal retrieval with this trimmed index. So by the way, it's, it's called the top docs uh, uh, heuristic. So you do your normal retrieval with top docs. Uh, that gives you a ranking. Uh, and then if you find that your ranking is unsatisfactory, right? Uh, when you're trimming the inverted list, you don't really know what effect it will have on the final scores. So uh, you do it in, you trim in the way that works on average for a bunch of queries. Um, but then if after the final ranking, if you find that your result is not satisfactory, you can always fall back to the main index. Right? So you do your retrieval based on the top docs list and then fall back uh, to, the main, uh, uh, to the main index. Um, so a, a generalization of that is called prioritized uh, processing. So this is something that's applicable to term at a time, uh, mostly. So remember, in term at a time, you're processing terms in an arbitrary order. Right? And usually, you just process them in the order in which they occurred in the query, but you don't have to. In fact, what you could do is you could estimate, out of these query terms, which one is the most important for the query. Right? Which one is going to affect the ranking the most? And how do you do that? Typically, that's high IDF terms. Uh, it's also terms that have a high variance in the TF scores. Right? So that's something that you could pre-compute. And then you can use that to arrange an ordering of your query terms and then process them in order. Right? And as you process, as you add each additional term to the scores, you try to estimate, well, how much variance in the score is left? How much could the score change? You know, I processed, uh, say, 10 out of 100 terms. How much could the scores change from the remaining 90? Well, they could still probably change a lot, right? What if I take the next 20? Can the scores still change much? Can they change much? And at some point, you just decide to stop. So that is actually similar to top docs. 
Um, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, so this, this is not smart to talk dogs. Uh, uh, but here's, um, so this, this is prioritizing the most significant terms. Another way you could do the same thing is you could actually sort the inverted lists. Usually inverted lists are sorted by document ID, uh, but you could easily sort them by decreasing TFIDF score. And if you do that, then you can, at runtime, decide when to stop. So you're walking down the list. Remember, when you're doing term at a time, it doesn't matter. You're not doing linear merge, so they, don't, they can be sorted in whatever order. And you can just walk down the list and decide, OK, from this point on, it doesn't look like the scores are going to be high enough for this inverted list, so I'm just going to stop processing and, uh, and go home and move on to the next term. So both of them are good strategies, and, uh, and they're applicable to term at a time. All right, um, I'll stop here, pick up on the next lecture. Thanks.